You're listening to Middle East expert and keynote speaker Neil Lazarus, live from Jerusalem. Welcome back to another podcast. First of all, thank you for everybody who's been in touch via Twitter uh, and also have emailed me. Uh, if you are interested in contact me, you can uh, send me a tweet at, at Awesome Seminars uh, and I will answer you. Um, today we have a very special guest and a very special show. I'm inspired by my friend Kay. Kay Wilson is a tour guide and she is also a survivor of a terrorist attack. I'm going to let her explain her own story. What I can tell you is it's a story which is chilling, yet somehow her message is also inspiring. Let me hand it over to Kay. This is the interview I conducted a little earlier this week. Hi, Kay. Thank you for joining us today on this podcast. Uh, for those of our listeners who are not familiar, can you tell us how one day in the forest your life was changed? I was working as an Israeli licensed tour guide and guiding a Christian-American friend. And we went for a hike on the Israel Trail on uh, one Sabbath afternoon. And uh, we sit on a rock, and suddenly I, I saw these two men crouched in the bushes. They asked for water in Hebrew, which is obviously crucial later on in the story, and I said I hadn't got any. They disappeared. I was feeling uneasy, so I just took out my pen knife in the event that they'd come and steal my backpack. And we're walking back down towards the car. Christine's behind me. I hear a scream, and as I try to turn around, one of them pounces on me from behind. So I'm trying to struggle and trying to stab him, and I managed to nick him in the leg, but he overpowers me, pulls me to my feet, and he draws out this machete, and then begins half an hour of standing in the forest, mid-afternoon, a beautiful autumn day, and the two of us are being held by two Palestinians at knife point. And at first, you know, obviously shock and trauma, but I try and pretend that I'm a tourist, that they find out my, uh, they find my Israeli ID. And uh, as time passes, they start to make some phone calls. And I'm wondering if we're going to be kidnapped. But when one guy comes back, he tells me to take off my shoes and he ties my hand behind my back with my laces. And then they gag us with Christine's feet, uh, fleece. And he takes off my Star of David. And the next thing I know, he pushes me to my knees. I hear the Islamic call of faith, and he starts stabbing me in the back, and I fall to the ground, and I'm laying on my side, and he's kneeling on me, and he's plunging that machete into me, and the only thing I can do is try and play dead, so I keep my eyes open, and that's because that's how people die, and I watch my friend five feet away just being hacked up before my eyes. They leave thinking we're both dead, and then after a few seconds they come back and he rolls me over and I, I watch him stab me in the chest and they leave again. And I have one last commission in life, so to speak, and that's to die, nearer where I parked the car so the police could find my body. And I managed to stand, turn my back on Christine, who's, well, what's left of her, and gag bound barefoot, I begin to walk through the forest. Um, orientating myself, where's north, where's west, and I'm, I'm bleeding to death, I can hardly breathe, mm. and somehow I managed to get back uh, to the picnic table, and there were two families there who'd, who saved my life and called an ambulance, and I'd walked actually over a mile, and I had six snap ribs that were poking out of my back, 30 additional fractures in my rib cage, a broken sternum, um, broken shoulder blade, dislocated shoulder, and 13 machete wounds in my uh, lungs and diaphragm. So, I, I mean, that state, you know, as I said, I walked back over a mile uphill. I was hospitalized, um, and six weeks later, because there was a press blackout, uh, there was a police conference, and they announced that the murders had been caught, and this was in part due to me stabbing one and the DNA on my knife. And they also confessed to murdering Netta Glatzorek, another Israeli woman, ten months previously. So, and I understand you actually. I understand you actually had to uh, attend the the hearing of these terrorists. Yes, I mean obviously I was in recovery. I mean I'm still in recovery, but uh, after nine months, 
the court case comes and I, I find myself in this tiny little room, you know, Jerusalem Regional Court, uh, facing the people who tried to murder me. And by the way, they confessed, they were giggling, they were proud of it. And the only reason I learned, the only reason that they hacked to death an American Christian is because that they thought that, like me, she was Jewish. How did you feel when you were sitting opposite the uh, people who had tried to kill you? Well, I wasn't scared. Um, and I don't say that in a bravado way. I mean, they were shackled and stuff. Um, I knew I had to look at them. But I was I started off, you know, just staring down at my feet and I, I mean they they're not pleasant looking people and I expected to see these same monsters I saw in the forest. And finally when I get a hold of myself so to speak and manage to look at them, I mean I'm in total shock. They looked so regular. I mean one of them sneezed and it was just so banal and I, I just asked myself rhetorically, how can two men who were once little boys grow up, plan, and pack at two innocent women without blinking an eye. So I was shocked by their banality, by their mocking of Christine's father, you know, as he was reading the impact statement. Uh, I think I had like this, I don't remember who said it, Sartre maybe, this existential nausea. I was sick of their sickness. And I was very thankful when they got sentenced. What do you take away from this? Uh, is it a hatred? Is it a, um understanding of, of people? Um, well, I'm still learning, Neil, but I think what it has given me is uh, really a clarity on issues. I mean, on a personal level, I know what to prioritise. You know, I know what to get worried about. I know that a, little, a lot of the things in the past um, what concern me or upset me, they really don't now, you know, priorities. Secondly, this, this clarity is also, it's kind of moral. I mean, I, I think we should hate evil. And the rampant incitement in the Palestinian authorities to be hated and, and pursued and changed. Uh, on the other hand, I do not hold every Palestinian accountable for what two thugs did. I mean, I have Palestinian friends, and they're also suffering under the same regime. And it's worth noting also that it was an Arab Muslim Israeli surgeon who saved my life. So I look at it like two Muslims attacked me and they made a choice to use their knives for evil. And, and one, I educated under Israel's system, he learned to be a surgeon and he used his knife skills. So I think I take away from it we have to hate evil um, and uh, love mercy, really. How do you feel uh, in the light of so much violence recently of ISIS, the Islamic State, terrorism, beheading? How does that affect you? Every time there's... Uh, well, obviously, I thought I was going to be beheaded at one point, so I'm still trying to find words, and unfortunately, words are very limited, but find words to <clears throat> articulate what goes through my mind. Uh, when there's a stabbing attack, and there's many in Israel, as you know, I mean, it's deeply personal. And we, just because of the age we live in, we dismiss things so easily, you know, but I know that that person who got stabbed, even lightly, is going to affect them for the rest of their life. So I, I'm able to emphasize quite deeply. Now, concerning ISIS and all of this wickedness, what I feel about them, I, I just feel the sooner they're annihilated and dealt with and the West picks up its courage and deals with these evil people, then the better. I feel terribly frustrated that uh, so many people are murdered daily and uh, the West seems very, very reluctant to really get its hands dirty to get rid of it. But it's not, in my understanding, it's not just ISIS. It doesn't just start with ISIS. Even the UK, which has, you know, we're both born there. The Islamification of the British Isles is very worrying. I mean, you have so-called faith schools who teach hatred. You have so-called Islamic charities that sponsor terrorism. You have people protesting with ISIS flags on London streets. And nobody does a thing. So I think uh, the apathy or the fear of the British public in particular, because it's where I was born, ultimately leads to more people joining uh, terrorist organizations. And if that was stamped out, then maybe we wouldn't have had a war with ISIS in the beginning.
tell me more about your uh, Muslim friends who, who stand with you, visited you, um, and, and supported you during this time. That must have been very strange. Which one? When you, when you, uh, you said that you had um, both a surgeon who was a, a Muslim supporting you <laughs> and a Palestinian, uh, you know, who was um, Yes, yeah, no, I had you. quite a few Muslim friends. It was... Uh, it, it, it wasn't strange to me. Uh, with the surgeon, I mean, it never occurred to me uh, until later and I found out. But because I already had uh, very deep friendships with some of my Arab friends, uh, it wasn't strange that they came to the hospital or, you know, would call me. I mean, one of my friends was absolutely distraught, and he lives in Bethlehem. He's a Palestinian Christian. And I realized he fears for his life uh, just like Jewish people do, really, you know. He can't speak out, he can't do this, he has his restrictions. So it wasn't for me, it wasn't strange from the people I knew because there was also, there was already a basis of some kind of substantial friendship there. Um, in fact, I found the friendships very helpful. The, the driver I worked with as a tour guide was an Israeli Arab. And in the beginning I had like terrible trauma just hearing Arabic. And he used to call me almost daily, and he's got a great sense of humor, you know, tell me jokes about politicians, or he'd curse at me in Arabic. I mean, he'd do these things as like a friend. So in some senses, um, a lot of my Arab friends uh, have been very instrumental in my continued healing. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. It's the, a pleasure is never the right word, but uh, you're privilege. one of those people yes, that privilege. motivate me for what I do as well. So thank you for joining us. And, thank uh, you, Neil. Thank you very much the for the opportunity. Kay Wilson. There's nothing really I can say after an interview with Kay. She's an inspiration. Um, there's not a message of hate. Uh, there's a new understanding of life and its values, and perhaps a an important lesson for all of us to learn. I hope you enjoyed isn't the right word, but I hope you got something out of this podcast. Neil Lazarus. Educating, motivating, challenging. If you love this podcast, you'll love the Neil Lazarus app. Just search for Neil Lazarus on the Apple Store or on Google Play. It's all of your news in one place.